chair recognizes Professor Blakey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I understand that one of our distinguished witnesses this morning is on somewhat of a tight time schedule. In the interest of time, therefore, I would will summarize my normal narration, but I would ask that it be included in the record as if read in full. So ordered. President John F. Kennedy was the fourth American president to be assassinated, but his death was the first that led to the formation of a special commission for the purpose of making a full investigation into its circumstances. In the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination, it was decided by President Lyndon B. Johnson that a panel of distinguished citizens should be given the responsibility for finding the full facts of the case and reporting them along with appropriate recommendations to the American people. The Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, was selected by President Johnson to head the commission. Two senior members of the Senate, Richard B. Russell, Democrat of Georgia, and John Sherman Cooper, Republican of Kentucky, were chosen to serve on the commission, as were two distinguished members from the House of Representatives, Hale Boggs, Democrat of Louisiana, and Gerald Ford, Republican of Michigan. Two attorneys who had been long in active government service, Alan W. Dulles, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and John J. McCoy, former president of the World Bank, were also named to the commission. J. Lee Rankin, former Solicitor General of the United States, was sworn in as general counsel on December 16, 1963. The mandate of the Select Committee on Assassinations calls for a full investigation of the performances of the federal agencies assigned to play any aspect in the Kennedy case. With the Warren Commission itself, the issue to be considered is whether its procedures, techniques, and organization were sufficient to carry out its mandate. In other words, the committee must consider the quality of the conduct of the commission to judge the reliability of its conclusions. Mr. Chairman, three members of the Warren Commission still living have agreed to appear here today and testify. They are Gerald R. Ford, John Sherman Cooper, and John J. McCloy. Our first witness, President Ford, received an A.B. degree from the University of Michigan in 1935 and an LLB degree from the Yale Law School in 1941. President Ford was a member of the 81st to the 93rd Congresses. He was elected minority leader in 1965, and he became the Vice President of the United States in 1973. He served as President of the United States from 1974 to 1977. It would be appropriate now, Mr. Chairman, to call President Ford. The committee calls President Ford. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you will give before this committee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. <laughs> Thank you. You may be seated. Welcome back to Capitol Hill, Mr. President. Thank you. Nice to see you here. Uh, for security purposes, we ask that all persons remain in their seats when you came into the room. Uh, at this time, the chair recognizes counsel for the committee, Mr. Gary Cornwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good Mr. morning. President. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I might, uh, I have a very short opening statement, which I would uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, read, and then I'll be glad to respond to whatever the questions may be of Mr. Cornwell. Mr. Mr. President, we'd be glad to receive your statement at this time. Uh, Chairman Stokes, uh, members of the committee, it's nice to be home. And it's a great honor and a great privilege to testify before this committee. And I thank you for the opportunity to appear along with my distinguished former colleagues on the Warren Commission, Senator John Sherman Cooper and the Honorable John McCloy. Each of us who were appointed by President Lyndon B. Johnson 
to the Warren Commission and who signed the final report of that commission are prepared to respond to questions as uh, submitted by you or the members of the committee or the staff. I trust the committee understands my particular situation. I am most willing to respond to any and all questions relating to my service on the Warren Commission and related matters. But I must respectfully refuse to answer questions under the principle of executive privilege that relate to the period from August 9, 1974 to January 20, 1977, the time that I served as President of the United States. The Warren Commission was given by President Lyndon B. Johnson the tragic responsibility to investigate the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. No member of the committee, commission sought the assignment, but each member believed it was a public duty to respond to the request of the president. It was not an easy or pleasant duty because each of us had known President John F. Kennedy. The commission under the chairmanship of the Chief Justice, Earl Warren, conducted, in my opinion, a thorough, objective analysis and investigation with the assistance of an outstanding staff and the help of many, many others within and without the federal establishment. The conclusions and recommendations of the Commission were unanimous. We believe the Commission report, despite questions that have been raised over the past 14 years, was an authoritative document covering one of the most tragic episodes in the history of the United States. In my own case, the staff of the committee has submitted a set of questions and requested responses in specific areas of inquiry. I will be glad to respond to the questions as propounded by Mr. Cornwall or members of the committee, and I thank you for the opportunity to make my opening statement. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, we appreciate your appearance here this morning. And uh, at this time, the chair will recognize Mr. Gary Cornwell for preliminary questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President, I'd like to initially direct your attention to the fact that in response to the assassination, there were a number of basic decisions made First, of course, to create a Warren Commission as opposed to rely, hypothetically, for instance, upon such other bodies as the Department of Justice for the purpose of supervising the investigation. Second, I'd like to focus your attention upon the decision to rely upon the investigative agencies as opposed to perhaps attempting to create an investigative staff of the Warren Commission. The question of time constraints that may have been imposed upon the members and their staff because, of course, they were influential and busy men and they did have outside interest which coincided with the operation of the Commission. And such things as the relationship between the Commission and the investigative agencies. I'd like to ask you to comment upon that, namely the effectiveness of the organization and the procedures which were adopted in response to the assassination. In my judgment, Mr. Cornwall, the uh, Warren Commission made a basic decision which was a proper one. We decided that it was inadvisable for the Commission to recruit a totally new investigating staff. And we felt that it was far better to pursue the procedure which we did, which was to employ a limited group of very outstanding and prestigious lawyers, as I recall, 14 in number, who came onto the staff and headed the staff organization. And then that staff, under the close supervision and control of the Commission worked with the various investigative agencies of the federal government, such as the FBI, the CIA, the Secret Service, and others. 
I must emphasize one point. Although the staff and the commission utilize the investigative personnel and capabilities of uh, organizations within the federal establishment, we as a commission and the staff were never satisfied with what information we got from these federal organizations. What we did was to use them as a base and then the staff and the commission uh, took off from there and uh, handled uh, individually the inquiries, the questions, and any leads that came uh, to the commission or to the staff. The Senate Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations looked into some of these same areas and in book five of their final report, they commented upon them. It is my understanding that your opinion was not consulted. In fact, I don't believe the opinions of the other Warren Commission members were consulted prior to the publication of that report. So I'd like to direct your attention to a limited portion of it and ask you to comment upon its accuracy from your point of view. At page six of the report, the Senate committee concluded that facts which might have substantially affected the course of the investigation were not provided the Warren Commission or those individuals within the FBI and the CIA, as well as other agencies of the government who were charged with investigating the assassination. The FBI was ordered by Director Hoover and pressured by higher government officials to conclude its investigation quickly. The FBI conducted its investigation in an atmosphere of concern among senior bureau officials that it would be criticized and its reputation tarnished. On page 46, the report goes on to note that with only minor isolated exceptions, the entire body of factual material from which the commission derived its findings was supplied by the intelligence community, primarily the FBI. And on page 47, the report concludes that although the commission had to rely on the FBI to conduct the primary investiga investigation of the president's death, their relationship was at times almost adversarial. Such a relationship was not conducive to the cooperation necessary for a thorough and exhaustive investigation. Would you agree with that? And to what extent, if any, would you think that such factors might have substantially affected the uh, effectiveness of the investigation? Well, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Cornwall, uh, the committee did send to me uh, this question, among others, and the material from the Church Committee report, because I want to be very accurate, since it involves uh, another committee of the United States Senate. I would like, if I might, Mr. Chairman, to read a response to the questions that uh, Mr. Cornwall has asked. And with your approval, I will do so. You certainly may do so. I concur with the conclusions of the Church Committee's final report, Book 5, page 6, which states, and I quote, the committee emphasizes that it has not uncovered any evidence sufficient to justify a conclusion that there was a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy, end quote. I categorically deny that the investigation of the assassination was deficient. The Church Committee concedes directly or by implication that the Commission's conclusions based on available evidence were correct. To date, I have seen no new evidence that would change my views as a former member of the Commission. The Church Committee states that the FBI was pressured by Director Hoover and higher government officials to conclude its investigation quickly. The Committee does not differentiate between the Commission's investigation and the investigations by the FBI and other federal agencies. The FBI may have hurried its internal investigation, but the Warren Commission set its own schedule for completion of its work based on its best estimate 
of the time required to carry out the mandate of President Johnson. When the Commission found that July 1964 was insufficient, the time was extended so we could properly conclude. The Church Committee erroneously assumed that the main investigation was done by the FBI, when in fact it was undertaken by the Commission and the 14 independent lawyers assembled by the Commission and the rest of the Commission staff. I do find in reading pages 6 and 7 of the Church Committee's report that questions of policy, procedures, decisions, and so forth are raised. But then, in many instances, the Committee report did not come to firm conclusions or make categorical recommendations based on their sources of information. My response to pages 46 and 47 of the Church Committee report are as follows. One, the Warren Commission did use the intelligence agencies of the federal government for the initial factual information and their preliminary analysis. However, the Commission and its staff never accept this, this material at face value. From the information supplied from all sources, an independent follow-up investigation was conducted by the Commission staff, including interviews, interrogations, and cross-checking. Conclusions by the Commission were based on this independent process and not on federal agency determinations. The Commission had an obligation to follow a dual policy. On the one hand, to get maximum voluntary cooperation from all federal agencies, including the FBI, and on the other hand, to be insistent that the agencies respond and cooperate wherever and however the Commission demanded. The latter requirement may have led some agencies to believe that there was an adversarial relationship. For the Commission to have adopted any other posture would have led the Commission critics to charge that the Commission was not carrying out its presidential mandate. I would next, Mr. President, ask you if you would direct your attention to the possibility of some outside pressure or concern upon the Commission. And for that purpose, I'd like to show you two exhibits marked for identification, JFKF 457 and JFKF 443. The first exhibit, Mr. Chairman, is a memorandum prepared by Presidential Assistant Walter Jenkins, dated November the 24th, 1963, and containing a resume of comments by FBI Director Hoover on that date. And the second one is a memorandum reflecting, well, a memorandum from Mr. Evans and the FBI to Mr. Belmont and attaching a memorandum of Deputy Attorney General Katzenbach dated November 25th. May we have those admitted into evidence, Mr. Chairman? Without objection, they may be entered to the record at this point. In particular, Mr. President, I'd like for you to respond to these portions of those memoranda. The, with respect to Exhibit 457, the Walter Jenkins Memorandum, according to the memorandum, Mr. Hoover stated on page 2, bottom paragraph, the thing I am concerned about, and so is Mr. Katzenbach, is having something issued so we can convince the public that Oswald is the real assassin. And thanks to the cooperation of the Justice Department, although it's not in your copy right there, Mr. President, today we have just received authority to declassify one additional sentence in that paragraph. That additional sentence reads, I felt this was that that the creation of a presidential uh, commission was better because there are several aspects which would complicate our foreign relations. The, in the second exhibit, number 443, 
Mr. Evans writes, the Deputy Attorney General Katzenbach handed to me this morning the attached memorandum which he has sent to Bill Moyers, who will be the principal assistant to President Johnson in the White House. Katzenbach said this memorandum was prepared by him after his discussions with, direct, with the director yesterday. And the, the attached memorandum at paragraph one and then paragraph numbered two, it states, it is important that all of the facts surrounding President Kennedy's assassination be made public in a way which will satisfy people in the United States and abroad that all the facts have been told and that a statement to this effect be made now. On paragraph two, it reads, speculation about Oswald's motivation ought to be cut off and we should have some basis for rebutting thought that this was a communist conspiracy or, as the Iron Curtain Press is saying, a right-wing conspiracy to blame it on the communist. And finally, in the materials which we previously provided to you, Mr. President, again, the Senate report, at page 41, there is a quotation from a memorandum by Richard Helms, cable to the CIA's Mexico station chief, Helms states, for your private information, their distinct feeling here in all three agencies, CIA, FBI, state, that Ambassador is pushing this case too hard and that we could well create flap with Cubans which could have serious repercussions. What I'd like to ask you is, were you aware of any such pressures at the time? And if so, to what extent, if any, do you think they might have distorted the investigative process? To the best of my recollection, and I remind the committee that uh, the commission operated, did its job 14 years ago. But to my best personal recollection, there was no pressure as a consequence of a memo or a statement by Walter Jenkins. There was no pressure uh, from any actions taken by Mr. Katzenbach. I, I fully would understand, however, the concern of the White House staff at that time for some uh, early resolution of uh, whatever the Warren Commission would decide. And I can understand why the Department of Justice and other federal agencies may have wanted some statement from the Commission at the earliest possible date. But to my best recollection, there was nothing that came from President Johnson or any of his associates in the White House. There was nothing that came to the Commission from the Department of Justice or from other federal agencies to hurry in an incomplete way uh, a decision by the Warren Commission. Now, again, to be very precise, I would like to read from a prepared response I have in reference to the Mexican uh, question that has been raised. I was not informed at the time of the Helms Cable to the CIA Mexican Station Chief, but to my best recollection, the members of the Commission were familiar with the strong personal feelings of the then U.S. Ambassador to Mexico. The Ambassador did believe that Castro was somehow involved in a plot to assassinate President Kennedy, and he was forceful in setting forth those views. This view of the Ambassador obligated the Commission to make a thorough investigation of the ambassador's charges and the helms and the attitude of the CIA, FBI, and state. Although the helms cable, to my best recollection, was not seen by me, I was familiar with the general views of the three departments as reflected in the helms cable. 
I believe the Commission obligation was carried out to investigate any divergent views between the Ambassador on the one hand and the three departments on the other. Mr. President, the Committee has received evidence about such things as the destruction of a note within the FBI that caused internal dissension at the time, a note which may have been from Oswald and was delivered to Special Agent Hostie. We have received evidence of such things as the existence of CIA assassination plots, an association between CIA officers and some members of the underworld. Was the Warren Commission familiar with those type of things, and if not, using the benefit of hindsight, could their existence have distorted the investigation? It's my best recollection that we were not familiar with the alleged destruction of the Oswald note to Hostie. From what I've read of the content or the alleged content of that note, I don't think the uh, course of the investigation would have been changed by uh, either the note itself or the destruction of that note. Um, the uh, other question that was raised, uh, the allegation that the CIA considered the possibility of using Oswald as a source of information. Uh, I'm not uh, able to recollect, one, whether we were familiar with that uh, possibility, uh, but in my opinion, uh, if we had known about it, I do not believe it would have significantly changed the course of or the conclusions of the Warren Commission. Uh, there was a question raised uh, about Mr. Hoover's theory of 1959 that uh, Oswald may have been an impositor. Well. I personally was not familiar with that uh, uh, attitude or of Mr. Hoover. Uh, that, in all honesty, I don't think that attitude on his part would have significantly changed the course of our investigation or uh, the um, conclusions of the commission. Uh, you also raised. Uh, uh, the question as to the connection or possible involvement of the underworld in uh, any assassination uh, plot. I would like to uh, state this for the record. I do not believe that if there was any association between some CIA officers and members of the underworld that that would have changed the conclusion of the Warren Commission. However, had the Warren Commission known of any assassination plots directed against Castro, this might have affected the extent of the Commission inquiry. In other words, if we had known of these uh, assassination plans or attempts, by an agency of the federal government, it certainly would have uh, required that the commission extend its inquiry into those kind of uh, uh, operations by an agency of the federal government. But from what I have known of those plots, uh, or what I've read or heard, I don't think they in and of themselves would have changed the conclusions of the commission. Finally, I would like to show you two exhibits marked for identification as JFKF 464 and 467. 
each of which respectively relate to the fact that the CIA may have considered at one point the possibility of using Oswald as a source of information. And the second one relating to a theory or speculation that Mr. Hoover had at one point that there may have been an Oswald imposter. May we have those admitted into the record, Mr. Chairman? Without objection, they may be entered into the record. Was the Warren Commission told about either such matter, to your knowledge, Mr. President? Not to my best recollection. And finally, the, commi the committee has received some evidence that there may have been an employee in the Cuban consulate in Mexico City, which may have had foreknowledge of the assassination, and that the employee may have been a member of Cuban intelligence. Did you receive any such information to your memory during the course of the Warren Commission's deliberations? It's my best recollection we were not so informed. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Counsel. At this point, the Chair will recognize uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Devine, for such time as he may consume, after which the committee will operate under the five-minute rule. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Devine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President, we welcome you here this morning, and we appreciate it. it must be a bit difficult uh, after 14 plus years to recall everything that occurred on this commission, particularly due to the vast responsibilities that were put upon you as both Vice President and President of the United States during the intervening time. With all due deference to the other members of the Warren Commission that are present, you did attain uh, probably the reputation of being the most conscientious member of the commission, uh, having attended more meetings and at, uh, interviewing more witnesses than anyone else on the commission at that time. In that connection, uh, Mr. Chairman, would Ms. Burning make available to the President JFK Exhibits 441 and 442? Clerk Elizabeth Burning has brung brun some exhibits to the President. Mr. President, I think you have had an opportunity to, on a previous occasion, review these two memorandums, one of which is dated December 12, 1963, and the other is December 17, 1963, both, of, uh, both memorandums being authored by the Assistant Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Mr. Cartha DeLoach. Uh, and I would like to ask you if these memorandum, if you had a chance to review them, accurately, or if they are accurate with respect to the conversations with you, and what, if any, uh, the relationship you had with the FBI during the operation of the Warren Commission. Uh, Congressman Devine, um, I appreciate the opportunity to um, respond to the two memorandums from uh, Mr. Deloche, one of December 12, 1963, and one of December 17, 1963. And if the committee will permit, I will read a prepared statement because I wish to be very accurate in this regard. During my service in the Congress from January 3, 1949, until appointed to the Warren Commission, I had had an excellent relationship with the FBI. It was not on a frequent basis. I barely knew J. Edgar Hoover, but like most Americans, had great respect for him and the Bureau. Over that period, I became reasonably well acquainted with Mr. Lou Nichols, who was Mr. Deloche's predecessor. Mr. Nichols had a long-standing friendship with eight or nine editors of Booth newspapers in Michigan, including the Grand Rapids Press, which was the Booth paper in my hometown. I met with Mr. Deloche through Mr. Nichols. And when Mr. Nichols retired, and whenever I had a congressional matter involving the FBI, I would contact Mr. Deloche. These were contacts well before 
my appointment to the uh, Warren Commission. After my appointment to the Commission, and following several of the Commission's organizational meetings, I was disturbed that the Chairman, in selecting a General Counsel for the staff, appeared to be moving in the direction of a one-man commission. My views were shared by several other members of the commission. The problem was resolved by an agreement that all top staff appointments would be approved by the commission as a whole. In my December 12, 1963 discussion with Mr. Deloche in my office, I told him of this temporary internal conflict with the commission within the Commission, I should say. In that same meeting with Mr. Deloche, we discussed several other matters, including involving a possible decisions of the Commission. And I related a visit to my office by Mr. John McCone, who was then director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Mr. Deloche gave me additional information on the matter discussed by Mr. McCone. On December 17, 1963, I again met with Mr. Deloche in my office, and the subjects discussed are set forth in the copy of the memo from Mr. Deloche to Mr. Moore. In reference to these meetings with Mr. Deloche and any questions relating to my relationship as a commission member with the FBI, I will state the following. One, I do not have any memoranda which shows that after December 19, 1963, I had any contact with Mr. Deloche, and I know of no other memoranda from any source. Two, the two contacts with Mr. Deloche, which were prior to December 20th, were made during the organizational period of the Commission and before any investigations or hearings were undertaken by the Commission. Number three, to my best recollection, the Deloche memos appear to be accurate, but the relationship mentioned by Mr. Deloche did not continue during the investigation period of the Commission. On Sunday, the 7th of June of 1964, Mr. President, you and I think uh, Justice, Chief Justice Warren went to Dallas and had an interview with Jack Ruby. you re re recall that situation? I recall it vividly, uh, Mr. Devine. I may further recall that during this conversation, Mr. Ruby said as follows, and this appears on page 194 of the transcript, gentlemen, if you want to hear any further testimony, you will have to get me to Washington soon, because it has something to do with you, Chief Warren. Do I sound sober enough to tell you this, Chief Justice Warren? Yes, go right ahead. Mr. Ruby, I want to tell the truth, and I can't tell it here. I can't tell it here. Does that make sense to you? I would ask you, uh, Mr. President, why was Ruby not taken to Washington for further questioning as he requested? First, uh, the Chief Justice, the Chairman of our Commission, and myself, along with several staff members, uh, thoroughly interrogated uh, Jack Ruby in Dallas on that Sunday afternoon. As I recall, the interrogation went three or four hours. We believe that we had fully probed all from him all of the information that he had available. And the Chief Justice, the Chairman, and I reported back to the other members of the Commission the interrogation that we had of Jack Ruby and the other members of the Commission had full access, of course, to the transcript. It is my best recollection that the other members of the Commission agreed with the Chief Justice and myself that it was not necessary to bring Ruby from Dallas to Washington and to go through 
uh, another uh, interrogation of him in the nation's capital. Secondly, as the transcript indicates, uh, Jack Ruby did request a polygraph uh, examination. At his request, uh, that was given, and the commission and the staff of the commission had the benefit of that uh, polygraph and that interrogation. So when you brought it all together, the uh, interrogation by the chairman and myself and the staff, plus the polygraph, it did not seem necessary uh, to bring Jack Ruby down to Washington for further investigation or interrogation. In other words, it was the feeling of the commissioner, at least a majority of them, that no meaningful purpose would be served by transporting him from Dallas to Washington. Is that, that is accurate? correct, sir. In another vein, Mr. President, if you know, why did Earl Warren agree to accept the position as head of the Warren Commission? I, ass <clears throat> I assume that the uh, response of the Chief would you Justice... Withhold, would you withhold a moment? I think we've yeah. lost our sound, Mr. President. I think that was a speaking unit. That was just that loud sound you heard was some equipment that just fell down. And uh, apparently it... it uh, unplugged the microphone system uh, for the members of the committee and they're trying to restore that now. Yeah. In this hearing room, on this subject, recall, a loud noise the, uh, like that is scary. Acoustics in this room are about the worst in Capitol Hill. Mr. Devine indicates that uh, his voice will carry and if yours will too, Mr. President, we can proceed. Let's show our independence from this mechanical age. And, uh, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Mr. Devine. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, let me repeat the question. If you know, uh, why did Chief Justice Warren accept the assignment as head of the Warren Commission? I believe that uh, Chief Justice Warren accepted the assignment from President Johnson for precisely the same reason that the other six of us did. Uh, we were asked by the President to undertake this responsibility as a public duty and service and despite the reluctance of all of us to add to our then burdens or occupations, we accepted it. And uh, I'm sure that was the personal reaction and feeling of the Chief Justice. Well, I know that you personally were reluctant to accept it. You did not seek the assignment, and I doubt if uh, any of the other members did. Uh, what was Alan Dulles' uh, role on the commission? Well, Alan Dulles uh, had a identical relationship and role on the commission with the rest of us. Uh, he was unique, however, in that he had served for a considerable period of time as the director of the CIA so that as a member of the commission, he could draw on that experience and expertise in any matters that involved uh, foreign intelligence uh, problems. It's my best judgment, Mr. Congressman, that we were fortunate to have had a person like Alan Dulles on the commission because of this background. Well, do you know, uh, Mr. President, what his informal relation was with the CIA at that time since he was the retired director? Did he have a, a, an opportunity to obtain more information for the commission because of that unique position? To my best knowledge, uh, he had no unusual relationship with the Central Intelligence Agency other than the fact that he had been a former director. As What's I said a moment ago, I believe that background and experience was beneficial to the Commission and not harmful or detrimental to our investigation and our recommendations and conclusions. Well, to put it another way, Mr. President, you then don't feel that his former relationship with the CIA 
in any way hindered the operation of the Warren Commission? Not at all, sir. If you know, uh, why has the public acceptance of the findings of the Warren Commission diminished uh, to reasonably low proportions over the years? Again, this is pure speculation, Mr. President, but we would like to have the benefit of your thinking. Because I would like to be very precise, uh, I have a written statement which I would like to read in this regard. Public acceptance of the Warren Commission findings has diminished for several reasons. Number one, the critics who have obtained the widest publicity have either deliberately or negligently misled the American people by misstating facts and by omitting crucial facts in their discussions. Secondly, there is general public cynicism about any report of an assassination back of a president. <laughs> the record shows questions after many years are still being raised as to the assassination of other presidents. Three, the overwhelming majority of the American people have not read the entire Warren Commission report. Now, under point one, let me make this specific uh, matter a matter of the record. The cover-up of the underlying facts in my opinion, of the Tibet murder has been a hallmark of critics of the Warren Commission. For instance, in the introduction to one of the best-selling books, Professing Oswald's Innocence, one reads, and I quote, the plain fact is there is no evidence at all to explain how or why the Dallas police sudden instantly pounced on Oswald. And until some adequate explanation is given, no one can be blamed for entertaining the most likely hypothesis, VIZ, that the Dallas police had undisclosed reasons for arresting Oswald even before they had avowable evidence pointing towards him. Once that hypothesis is admitted, almost all of the evidence accepted by the commission can be reinterpreted in a different way, end quote. In my opinion, no investigation of the tragic assassination of President Kennedy can be complete without including an investigation of the murder of Dallas police officer J.D. Tibbet. Almost all who have claimed that Lee Harvey Oswald was innocent of the murder of President Kennedy have also claimed that Oswald was innocent of the murder of Tibbet. This is despite the fact that at least six eyewitnesses who either saw the murder or saw the Tibbet gunman leaving the murder scene with a gun in hand identified that gunman as Lee Harvey Oswald. Moreover, Oswald was arrested with a Tibbet murder weapon in his possession. The arrest of Oswald was an outgrowth of the acts of an alert citizen in Dallas, J. Calvin Brewer, who managed a shoe store in the neighborhood of the Tibbet shooting. Shortly after Brewer learned from radio broad newscasts about the shooting of Tibbet in his neighborhood, he became suspicious of the way a man first ducked into the entryway of his shoe store where police sirens were heard coming down the street and then left the front of the store soon after the police sirens subsided. Brewer followed the man down the street into the Texas theater and then had the cashier call the police. When the police arrived at the theater, Brewer pointed out the man who was Lee Harvey Oswald. As the policeman approached, Oswald pulled out a revolver. Carrying a concealed gun is a crime. The fact that Oswald had such a weapon in his possession and drew it is highly suspicious. 
Subsequent evidence provided that this very revolver had been purchased through the mail by Oswald under the same alias he used to acquire the rifle used in the assassination of President Kennedy. <coughs> Both Oswald's revolver and Oswald's rifle were mailed to the same post office box in Dallas. Witnesses at the Tibbet murder scene saw the gunman throw cartridge cases into the bushes as he reloaded his revolver. And irrefutable ballistic evidence proved that those cartridges, cartridge cases came from Oswald's rifle, the revolver, to the exclusion of all other weapons in the world. This exactly corresponds with the ballistic evidence that proved that the bullet found off Governor Conley's stretcher in Parkland Hospital in Dallas and the two large bullet fragments in the president's limousine, which came from the bullet which struck President Kennedy's head, came from Oswald's rifle to the exclusion of all other weapons in the world. Now, the point I wish to make is that in too many cases, some of the critics of the Warren Commission have either misstated or omitted facts that were developed by the Commission <coughs> and in the process of either an omission or a misstatement have led the, the public to have less than full support for the Commission's recommendations and uh, conclusions. Thank you, Mr. President. I have one question in a completely different vein. As you know, one of the mandates that the Congress has placed on this select committee is to ultimately make recommendations. You, as President, were the subject of a number of attacks and fortunately escaped with your hide. Pretty healthy now. Yes, you certainly took <laughs> So Glad she missed. And not wanting to be distasteful, but, and God forbid that another situation occur like occurred during the Kennedy years, that I hope we never have another assassination or assassination attempt, but it's my understanding that if such a thing would occur, they would go through the same autopsy procedures that they did back in 1963, that whoever was president would be taken to Bethesda Hospital and he would be looked at by uh, probably clinical pathologists rather than forensic th uh, pathologists. It's my understanding also, Mr. President, that the Metropolitan Police Department here has anticipated that type of need for any so-called VIP and that they have put together what they call an executive autopsy procedure where they have uh, everything available, they have videotaped available, they have forensic pathologists available. And that leads up to this question, Mr. President. Do you, in your capacity as a former president, as a former member of the Congress, <coughs> one that has been deeply involved in the Warren Commission and the assassination problems, do you have, have any recommendations that you would like to make to this committee, either legislatively or uh, procedurally, as it relates to a situation like this occurring in the future? Well, number one, uh, I am glad that uh, some plans have been laid to uh, maybe make the procedure in the case of another tragedy uh, uh, in better, more professional hands. I'm talking about the uh, autopsy. Um, from what I read, the, this committee has uh, determined that the uh, autopsy procedure at Bethesda was not conducted by the experts or professionals in that area. That was, of course, unfortunate. And I trust that what is now uh, laid out uh, would eliminate whatever the difficulties were uh, at the time of President Kennedy's assassination. Um, 
if such an assassination were to take place again. I'm certain that there would be a public demand for some uh, organization to undertake an investigation. I don't think the public would be satisfied with any one or all of the federal agencies themselves investigating and coming to conclusions. So you come down at the bottom line, I would recommend that uh, in such a tragedy that uh, what President Johnson did would be repeated. I see no better alternative. I just hope it doesn't happen again. But if it did, I think that's the best option. Do you feel there is any need for further legislation in this area? As you know, at the time of the occurrence of the Kennedy assassination, it was not within the jurisdiction of the Federal Bureau of Investigation to investigate or have jurisdiction in matters of this nature. That has been changed during the interim period. As I recall, that was a recommendation of the Commission, and Congress responded to it. Uh, so, at least legislatively, uh, we probably have a better circumstance today than we did in 1963. Uh, and other things have improved, as uh, you've indicated. I would like to uh, make a comment uh, so the record is clear. Even though there may have been some <clears throat> inadequacies uh, at the time the autopsy was undertaken uh, in Bethesda, uh, as I understand it, the uh, individuals who investigated and actually reviewed the material on the autopsy a very distinguished group from what I read, uh, they have come to the conclusion that uh, the same as those who did it before, that Oswald was shot uh, from behind. Kennedy. I mean, Kennedy was shot from behind. Fine. Thank you, Mr. President. The time of the gentleman has expired. The committee will now operate under the five-minute rule. Mr. President, in the commission arriving at the conclusion that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin, to what degree did the commission struggle with the question of motive and what was the final conclusion relative to his motive? <clears throat> My best recollection, and I repeat it 14 years later, is that we were not able to precisely pin down a motive uh, for the assassination by uh, Lee Harvey Oswald of President Kennedy. There was no way of really being definitive uh, as to that motive, and so we could only speculate. Did it come to the attention of the Commission that uh, the CIA had in their possession a Soviet defector by the name of Yuri Nosenko, who claimed to have information about Lee Harvey Oswald while he was living in the Soviet uh, Russia? It's my best recollection the Commission was cognizant of the existence of Mr. Nosenko. It's also my best recollection that there was no certainty within the intelligence community of the federal government as to whether he was a plant on the one hand or bona fide on the other. There was that difference of opinion. And uh, so the commission uh, had to make its own decision as to the validity of whatever information he had. I would take it from that then that in terms of the the agency, that is the CIA, they were unable to to give you some definitive information relative to his bona fides so that you might then come to a, a conclusion relative to any information regarding Oswald in the Soviet Union. I think that's uh, generally correct, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. 
Now, yesterday we had a, a former agent from the FBI who testified before our committee. Mm -hmm. And the way he explained the investigative procedure was that the commission conducted its own investigation, that the FBI conducted their own investigation, mm -hmm. And I think the term he used was they did their own thing, we did our own thing. If they requested anything from us, we gave them whatever they asked for. Uh, would it be your recollection that that was the way that uh, the commission operated investigatively and FBI operated? Let me put it my way. Sure. The FBI, and I use that as an example, undertook a very extensive investigation. I don't recall how many agents, but they had a massive operation to investigate everything. The commission, with this group of 14 lawyers and some additional staff people, then drew upon all of this information which was available and we, if my memory serves me accurately, insisted that the FBI give us everything they had. Now that is a comprehensive order from the commission to the director and to the FBI. I assume, uh, and I think the commission assumed, that that order was such, uh, so broad that if they had anything, it was their obligation to submit it. Now, if they didn't, uh, that's a uh, failure on the part of the agency, not on the part of the commission. Uh, Mr. President, was the commission made aware of the fact that uh, as a result of an investigation or an inspection, which was directed by J. Edgar Hoover, uh, the 17 agents were found to be deficient in the pre assassination investigation relative to Oswald? To my best recollection, at least I was not familiar with any uh, reprimand or uh, corrective action taken by the director. Thank you, Mr. President. My time has expired. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Pryor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to have you here, Mr. President, and Senator Cooper and Mr. McCloy as the three members of the Warren Commission that can testify today. I think one of the problems the Warren Commission has had is that you went out of existence immediately upon the filing of the report, and you haven't had the opportunity to answer your critics. There's been no official Warren Commission. And so I think it's very appropriate that you have this chance to answer for the historical record today. Following up on the question, Mr. Devine, I ask, one of the mandates of this committee is how should we deal with the eventuality of a high-level assassination in the future? The Warren Commission was the first citizens commission, as I understand, which investigated an assassination in the past we've left it up to the normal course of the judicial system. You have had experience with citizens' commissions. Uh, you appointed the Rockefeller Commission, I believe, and you served on this commission. In view of your experience, do you feel that a high-level political assassination uh, should be dealt with by a citizens' committee, or should we leave it up to the normal workings of the judicial system? I would strongly uh, advocate a high-level citizens' commission as was done by President Johnson. To leave it up to the uh, agencies of the federal government, in my opinion, would uh, multiply cynicism and skepticism as to the um, conclusions. We certainly have had our problems uh, with all the critics floating around, but uh, I think if 
the in-house agencies of the federal government had done the job and come to the same conclusions we did, I believe the uh, critics would have been far, far greater. And so I recommend what President Johnson did as a possibility for the future. One further question on that score. The Warren Commission did not employ its own investigative staff and used agencies in place to develop the basic uh, information, uh, the FBI and CIA Secret Service. You have indicated that Warren Commission decision-making was independent of any conclusions of those agencies and that you cross-checked their information. But in the future, if a Citizens Commission is set up, would it be your judgment that they should employ its own investigative staff uh, as well as forming its independent conclusions with a limited staff? Or do you feel that using agencies in place and forming your judgment on that as the Warren Commission did is the best way to go? It's my best judgment that the procedure and the policy the Warren Commission followed was the correct one. And I would advocate any subsequent uh, commission to follow the same. For the Warren Commission to have gathered together a, an experienced staff to get them uh, qualified to handle classified information, to establish the organization that would be necessary for a sizable number of investigators would have been time consuming and in my opinion would not have answered what we were uh, mandated to do. It's my uh, strong feelings that what we did was the right way. We were not captives of, but we utilized the information from the in-house agencies of the federal government. And we, after getting the benefit of their experience and reports, we undertook by a wide variety of procedures to verify or to undercut what they uh, had given us. Thank you, Mr. President. Time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Connecticut, uh, Mr. McKinney. Mr. President, it's a pleasure to have you here. Basically, I think uh, to follow up on the uh, Judge Pryor's line of questioning, the then Assistant Attorney General, Mr. Katzenbach, in a deposition to this committee, and I quote from page 19, stated, perhaps naively, but I thought the appointment of Alan Dulles to the commission would ensure that the commission had access to anything that the CIA had. I am astounded to this day that Mr. Dulles did not at least make the information available to the other commissioners. He might have been skeptical about how far it was to go to the staff or how it might be further investigated because there was somewhat more of an aura of secrecy surrounding the CIA in 1964 than there is in 1978. We have found out that there were CIA files and information, of course, that were not given to the Warren Commission. So following through, I think, on, on the uh, judge's question, did you at the time feel information was being withheld and how would you handle this if a, another commission were to be formed, and let's hope it never has to be, to make sure that the commission knew it was getting all information? I had the feeling then, as a member of the commission, that we were getting all of the information from any one or all of the federal agencies, including the Central Intelligence Agency. Obviously, there was some information as to assassination plots that, to my best recollection, was not given to us. Uh, 
uh, I can't give you a 100% guarantee how you can get that information. It depends on uh, individuals. It depends on the system. Why we weren't given it, uh, quite frankly, I don't understand. Continuing on in that same deposition in, in, on page uh, 20, uh, he says, it never occurred to me that the FBI would cover up anything. If you ask me the question, if the FBI failed to do something it should have done, would they have covered up that? My answer to you is, even then, would have been yes. They probably would not cover, cover up information that somebody else was guilty of something of the kind, but if the Bureau had made any mistake or anything for which the public might criticize the Bureau, the Bureau would be, do its best to conceal that information from anybody, including the Commission. Uh, of course, we find out now that this was uh, true in the case uh, of the uh, action that was brought against the agents for uh, a supposed failure before the assassination and handling the case of Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, again, it seems to be a, a fact that the, that the Bureau was withholding from the Commission despite a presidential mandate. Is there any way that you can... Uh, that you could suggest that perhaps we as a committee could, and as again, I keep hoping this will never have to happen, but give a, a legislative or, or governmental standing to this type of commission should it ever have to be uh, formed again, which would override this type of bureaucratic decision within agencies such as the CIA or the FBI or so on. I don't believe it's necessary to have a legislative charter for a commission of this kind. If my recollection is correct, we did get, as a commission, legislative authority to put witnesses under oath and to interrogate them uh, uh, under those circumstances. As I recall, we had to get special legislation for that purpose, which we did. I think that's enough, or I think that's sufficient to uh, ensure that we had the power to uh, pursue any and all angles. I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time, time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Dodd. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President, uh, to uh, reiterate the remarks of my colleagues, it is a pleasure to have you uh, here with thank us. You. And, Capitol Hill and particularly in the Cannon Building, uh, which you were telling us earlier was your place of residence as a member of Congress for some years. I had an office on the third floor down the hall for 16 years. Welcome back. I'd like to, if I could, uh, Mr. President, uh, direct your attention to the two memos uh, I think you have in front of you, number 441, exhibits 441 and 442. These are the, um, the Deloach uh, memos. And I'd like to, if I could, uh, ask you to to, uh, to respond to some questions with regard to the December 12, 1963 memo, if I could first. There are particularly two paragraphs. The very first paragraph of the memorandum and the next to the last paragraph of the memorandum. The first paragraph uh, for the purpose of the record reads, and I'm quoting here from it, I had a long talk this morning with Congressman Gerald R. Jerry Ford, Republican of Michigan, in his office. He asked that I come up to see him. Upon arriving, he told me that he wanted to talk in the strictest of confidence. This was agreed to. And then referring to the next to the last paragraph of the same memo, and again I'm quoting Mr. Deloach here, Ford indicated he would keep me thoroughly advised as to the activities of the commission. He stated this would have to be done on a confidential basis. However, he thought it should be done. He also asked if he could call me from time to time and straighten out questions in his mind concerning our investigation. I told him by all means he should do this. He reiterated that our relationship would, of course, remain confidential. Mr. President, uh, I would like to, to ask you some questions about this if I could. First of all, uh, the December 5th and December 16th meetings of the Commission, is it my understanding that those meetings were closed to the public and press? These were executive sessions? 
I don't recall those precise uh, meetings, Mr. Congressman, but uh, it's my best recollection that all uh, meetings of the Commission were uh, in executive session. Not only those, but all that followed. And it, as I understand it, Mr. Deloach would not have had necessarily access directly to the meetings. There was liaison with the FBI, but he was not the liaison person. He was not the liaison person, but uh, there was an FBI liaison officer there, uh, as I recall, at all hearings. If I understood your, your testimony accurately this morning, you, you stated that you, uh, you felt that the, that the information that was contained in these uh, two, uh, two memorandums, two documents, was basically, basically accurate, and yet uh, you said that you had terminated your relationship with Mr. Deloach in terms of these kinds of meetings after this December 17th uh, meeting you had with him. Can I therefore conclude that Mr. Deloach's statements on the, with regard to the next to the last paragraph on the second page of the December 12th memorandum is wrong? As I said in a uh, prepared statement which I read in reference to both memorandums, it's my best recollection that we no longer had uh, con uh, contacts as indicated in these two memos. And to my best information, there are no other memoranda that would uh, indicate a continuing relationship. There are these two all of which meetings took place in the organizational phase. To my best knowledge, and I asked the staff of the committee to check most carefully, uh, there are no other memoranda uh, indicating uh, contacts with Mr. Deloche. Mr. President, in that second, or, uh, second sentence of that uh, next to last paragraph, uh, quoting it again, he stated uh, that these, referring to you, I believe, he stated this would have to be, a uh, be on a confidential basis. However, he thought it should be done. Do you recall what your motivation was, if, if that is a correct statement, uh, at the time that you thought it should be done and then having changed the relationship, but at that particular time, why you felt that it might be important to have this kind of a confidential relationship with Mr. Deloach? Well, number one, as I said in the prepared response earlier, uh, I, like most Americans at that time, had great respect for the director, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, and for the uh, achievements and the accomplishments of the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. And I had developed a personal relationship uh, on a very uh, off and on basis uh, uh, with Mr. Deloche. If I had a member, if, if I had a question as a member of Congress, that involved the FBI, such as you would have today, there is somebody over at the FBI you can call and he'll come and see you. That's the kind of relationship I had with Mr. Deloche. If I had a problem that involved the FBI, my contact at that time was Mr. Deloche. I don't know who your contact would be at the present time, but there is a person at the FBI who will respond to your inquiries. And that was my relationship with Mr. Deloche. And uh, at the outset, during the organizational phase of the commission, we had some problems. We were concerned about what appeared to be the attitude of the chairman. He wanted a one-man commission. Most of the members of the commission didn't agree with that. Uh, there were other organizational matters that uh, I thought I could get a better feel for if I talked to Mr. Deloche and had the benefit of his or the FBI investigations. And that's why I had those two meetings. And to my best recollection, uh, that relationship terminated at the conclusion of the December 17th meeting. You sort of, uh, Mr. President, anticipated my, my next question. I, I wanted to know if I could uh, from you why you felt it was important uh, uh, that the that you share this information specifically with the FBI, particularly when they seem to have been at least on a couple of them sort of internal matters, who should be chief counsel, uh, for instance, uh, 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 
whether or not there should be a press release issued on the FBI report. Granted, it was on the FBI report, but that, again, sounds more like an internal matter to the commission, what they should be doing, or uh, uh, whether or not the, uh, uh, when the Chief Justice wanted to finalize the report. It, it just seems to me, I'm curious about why the FBI? Why not uh, someone else? Well, in the course of a conversation, maybe 15 minutes, you cover a lot of subjects. Some of it may be related to or pertinent to the organizational. Some of it may be just uh, general information. Uh, I, I can't help but indicate here that uh, in one of these memos, it does state that John McCone, then head of the CIA, came to see me. And it's also indicated in here that Mr. McCone went to see other members of the commission. Now, uh, was that improper? Uh, Mr. McCone was the head of an organization which was in the process of being investigated by the commission. Uh, I don't think you turn a person away, a person of that responsibility, and I didn't. And I think it was perfectly proper. I don't know what other members of the commission did, but uh, you have to remember we were a unique group that were trying to get all the information we could. It was our obligation. It was mandated by President Johnson. And uh, in the organizational phase, we had a lot of questions and, uh, frankly, uh, uh, I think it was very proper to do what I did. You mentioned the gentleman has expired. Could I ask unanimous consent to proceed for a couple additional minutes, Mr. Chairman? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, you mentioned in the memos as well I, that, that you thought these meetings ought to be confidential. Uh, and can I assume that, that was it your understanding, given the personal relationship with Mr. Deloach, that they would only be information you would share with him as an individual, or did you fully expect him to report to supervisors or superiors of his within the Bureau as to any uh, comments, suggestions, and statements that you might have made to him in those meetings? I uh, didn't pursue what the process would be after he left my office. Uh, uh, frankly, it didn't occur to me I should uh, uh, check it out. I only know what our two relationships were on those two occasions, December 12 and December 17th of uh, 1973, 63. Did you, uh, uh, Mr. President, by any chance you mentioned that Mr. McCone sought out uh, various other uh, commission members, uh, in fact, he sought out you to talk to you about something. Did, uh, did you seek out anyone else in any other agency to talk to at that time other than Mr. Deloach? Not to my best recollection. And I gather from what you uh, mentioned just a minute ago that, uh, that there were other uh, personnel from various investigatory agencies that did contact other members of the commission from time to time. Was, or is that, is that an accurate statement of your... Well, I... Uh can't verify it one way or another. I, I have no way of knowing who might have contacted other members of the commission. And certainly my memory uh, at this point would uh, not be sufficiently accurate to make such a charge. Am I to understand that because of the confidentiality or the nature of these, these two meetings with Mr. Deloach, that the other members of the Warren Commission at the time were not aware of the fact that you had met with Mr. Deloach? Uh, to my best recollection, I didn't uh, indicate to them that I'd had those meetings, no. And uh, did Mr. Deloach, it, it, and I granted this is going back a long time, but do you recall whether or not he shared any information with you uh, as to their feelings that you brought back to the commission? Was it... Uh, uh, comments, statements, suggestions, anything that he might have had that he made to you that you would then bring to the commission as a member of that commission? I don't uh, recall that any advice or suggestions he made were uh, conveyed by me back to the commission, no. Uh, 
At least that's the, my best recollection. Fine. Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you. I have no further questions. And again, Mr. President, I appreciate you being here today. Thank you. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Ford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. President, I'd like to first join with my colleagues in, in thanking you for appearing here uh, this morning. I only have one question for you, uh, Mr. President. Do you feel that the Warren Commission received full and honest information from the FBI and the CIA in regards to Oswald's connection, uh, alleged connection with foreign governments? To the best of my recollection, I think we got from any and all of the federal agencies all of the information they had as to Oswald's connection with any foreign government. One final question. What about the Secret Service? Did the Warren Commission ever have dialogue or communication with the uh, Secret Service? Oh, yes. We uh, had uh, uh, testimony, as I recollect, from the director, who was Mr. Raleigh at the time. Uh, we uh, interrogated as a commission several of the agents and the members of the staff, uh, our staff, commission staff, uh, made a thorough investigation of the advanced procedures of the Secret Service, uh, the uh, actual operations of the Secret Service while President Kennedy was in uh, Dallas. The uh, commission and the staff, in my opinion, made a very thorough investigation of all the responsibilities and activities of the Secret Service. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, thank you for coming. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Sawyer. <coughs> Mr. President, uh, again, I join with the others in saying what a pleasure it is to have you here. You've been really my only claim to distinction as a, as a freshman congressman here. You'd be amazed how many times when I'm introduced to somebody, they say, this is the, this is the fellow who occupies Gerald Ford's seat. Uh, and the seat you held was such distinction for 25 years. Thank you. Uh, well, on the, going back to this Tippett situation, uh, one thing that's bothered me consistently, and I have to confess that up till now I, I haven't had any substantial enlightenment on it, and I just wonder if you had formed an opinion, uh, not not with respect to whether uh, whether Oswald shot Tippett, I'm totally satisfied on that, uh, and I think the evidence is overwhelming on that, but, but why Tippett stopped Oswald is, uh, is a perplexing question, and that at that point in time, as you may recall, Oswald had gone to an entirely different area of the city. Uh, far removed, was only walking up the street. Uh, the description uh, that had been issued was, uh, well, Oswald in the general description would uh, just be kind of an average guy in size and general appearance. Did, did you form any opinion on that? Well, unfortunately, because of his murder, uh, we never got any uh, testimony from Officer Tibbet. Uh, but I assume that he was a good officer. And uh, he had been alerted uh, that uh, there had been an assassination, and I suspect that any uh, well-qualified alert officer w was anxious to pursue anything that was suspicious. Uh, I think we ought to compliment and congratulate Tibbet for uh, undertaking this uh, effort that he did unfortunately resulted in his death but why he did other than carrying out his responsibilities I wouldn't know. Do you think uh, that there would be any advantage uh, in, a, in a criminal law on uh, de applying to such a commission let's say as the Warren Commission uh, making it a federal crime for any agency personnel uh, to withhold or not provide all pertinent information that they're requested to provide? I haven't studied this, but 
uh, are there not present laws on the statute books that would permit uh, such a uh, uh, charge? Uh, I can't. I can't answer you that. If not, I think that ought to be investigated. Fine. Thank but you very. Thank you very much, Mr. President. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has, has expired. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Fithian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to join in, uh, with the others in expressing my appreciation for your coming this morning. I have just two areas I'd like to explore briefly with you. Uh, I'd like to return for just a minute. Uh, to your earlier statement concerning bullet frag fragments found in the presidential uh, limousine. In reviewing the Warren Commission, I find that the FBI tests of the fragments, uh, both through spectrographic and neutron activation analysis, uh, could not, in fact, determine the origin of the fragments. Uh, I just uh, want to read briefly from the Commission report. Um, each of the two bullet fragments had sufficient unmutilated area to provide a, the basis for an identification. However, it was not possible to determine whether the two bullet fragments were from the same bullet or from two different bullets. With regard to the other bullet fragments discovered in the limousine in the course of treating President Kennedy and Governor Conley, however, expert examination could demonstrate only that the <laughs> fragments were similar in metallic composition to each other, to the two larger fragments, and to the nearly whole bullet, uh, is it your recollection that that other evidence or other tests were uh, run on the bullet fragments other than what I have had access to? I am not able to recollect that detail as to what uh, other tests, if any, were conducted at that time. Thank you. Um, I would like uh, to ask you about uh, something that has been troubling me throughout our investigation and, and uh, some reports uh, that uh, there was uh, unusual pressure to either arrive at an early conclusion that it was Oswald alone uh, or to arrive at unanimity that, uh, that uh, Oswald was the lone assassin, etc. There was a report in 1975 pertaining to a June 4th meeting of the Commission, and the report uh, in the Washington Star indicated that uh, Ford provoked, quote, Ford provoked a near uproar in the panel when on June 4th, 1964, he charged that outside forces were trying to pressure the Commission to decide in advance that Oswald was a solitary assassin. Uh, I wonder if you would help the committee out by commenting on this report. I have no recollection of uh, that particular June 4th meeting or any uh, pressure that the Commission received for any definitive conclusion. Uh, as other members of the Commission, I think, will testify, uh, we had a unanimous vote as to the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald committed the assassination and all other decisions of the Commission were also unanimous. There was no pressure. We operated as a, a unit of seven members who fortunately all agreed. I want to return briefly to the unanimous question in just a moment, but uh, is it then your, your testimony that, uh, in your judgment, uh, the FBI uh, had not decided prematurely that it was Oswald, uh, that there was no evidence that you have that the FBI held information from the Commission or gave information to the Commission that would make the Bureau look better uh, instead of, quote, everything that you, you asked for? I suspect that the FBI, uh, after its investigation, uh, came to the conclusion that Oswald was the assassin. And I suspect there's evidence, reports uh, around the Bureau or maybe over in our files that that was their conclusion. But I emphasize their conclusion did not determine the uh, conclusion of the Commission. What they came to as a conclusion was helpful to the Commission, but it didn't decide uh, for the Commission what our conclusion was. I 
expired. I ask the honest consent to ask one additional question, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Mr. President, it has um, been reported in many places that there was some difficulty arriving at the unanimity of the conclusiveness of the evidence for the final report, and that in order to get the unanimity, which is historical record now, uh, certain very carefully drafted language, of, such as no evidence to the contrary or according to the evidence presented to us, and then the, the conclusion. Would you care to comment on the, the, the effort to, at drafting the report in, in such a way? Did you have any problem arriving at that unanimity uh, short of drafting some very careful, artful language? There was a recommendation, as I recall, from the staff that could be summarized this way. Number one, Lee Harvey Oswald was the assassin. Two, there was no conspiracy, foreign or domestic. The commission, after looking at this suggested language from the staff, uh, decided unanimously that the wording should be much like this, and I'm not quoting precisely from the commission staff, but I'm quoting the substance. Number one, that Lee Harvey Oswald was the assassin. Number two, the commission had found no evidence of a conspiracy, foreign or domestic. Now, the second point is quite different from the language which was recommended by the staff. Uh, I think the commission was right to make that revision, and I stand by it today. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time, the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Thone. Welcome back, uh, Mr. President. The hour is late. Uh, just one question. No, there was no question but that the Federal Bureau of Investigation had a lot of background material on Harvey Lee Oswald that should have alerted uh, them, I'm sure did alert them, to the fact that uh, he could uh, very well have been a security problem. They also knew, as I understand it, at least one agent knew that he was working in the Texas Book Depository. It's my understanding that that information was not then transmitted to the Secret Service. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions uh, regarding this obvious breakdown in communication? At one time I knew that whole story, but I must say I uh, can't recall all the details. Uh, I think the conclusion of the commission was that there had to be a better liaison between the FBI and the Secret Service and any or other agencies involved in intelligence, etc. And I trust and hope that that interrelationship has been improved. It wasn't the best at that time as my memory uh, serves me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. The time of gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Edgar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to welcome you to the committee today and thank you for your answers to our questions. Mr. President, was there a sit-down meeting of the Warren Commission with the FBI, the CIA, and the Secret Service at the very beginning of the Warren Commission's investigation to outline an investigative plan for the Commission? I do not recall any meeting of the full Commission with the Director of FBI, the Director of the CIA, and the Director of the Secret Service. I'm not sure such a meeting was necessary or essential. Our first responsibility was to appoint a staff, which we did, and to lay out a procedure by which we would investigate, etc. cetera. Uh, Mr. Rankin and the Chief Justice, if my memory is accurate, had the, the basic man-to-man uh, -man relationship with the head of the FBI, Secret Service, and the uh, CIA. And uh, it's my feeling that 
that uh, interrelationship was sufficient from the point of view of myself as a member of the commission. Did the commission itself have an investigative plan? Well, we had a plan that was under the uh, direction of the commission and implemented by the staff. And that was a very specific investigation method, procedure, and I think it worked. The reason for my question is that we've uncovered some information that the Secret Service and the FBI and the CIA didn't talk together very well and did not share information with each other prior to the assassination. And that there is some evidence that even after the assassination, each of them worked separately and apart from each other. And wouldn't it have been a proper role of the Warren Commission to act as a coordinating function between these three agencies to get them to share information about Lee Harvey Oswald or about the investigation. If you will return or look at uh, Congressman Eckerd, the report of the commission, page 24, uh, under uh, subparagraph small c, the report says, and I'll read it for you, the Commission has concluded that there was insufficient liaison and coordination of information between the Secret Service and other federal agencies necessarily concerned with presidential protection. It goes on, but that's a summary of the rest of the paragraph. Yes, I think we found there was insufficient liaison, coordination before. Uh, I don't think it was necessarily required that they have liaison afterwards in the course of the investigation. But it certainly was necessary uh, to do a good job if there had been good liaison before the assassination. Thank you. Moving to another area. In reference to the disciplinary action of the 17 agents of, of the FBI, to the best of your recollection, when did you first come to know about the disciplinary action? To be honest with you, um, I did not know of that disciplinary action at any time while I was a member of the commission. Do you think that knowledge of that information would have been helpful to the commission in light of the fact that J. Edgar Hoover indicated that part of the reason for the disciplinary action was that the agent should have been aware of Lee Harvey Oswald's background and placed him on the security index. It might have been helpful to the commission, but I don't think it would have altered in any way the final recommendations or conclusions. I think we might have been helped by that information, but I don't think it would have varied our Commission's conclusions. Time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent for two additional minutes. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Mr. President, you mentioned the importance of uh, Officer Tibbet. I wonder if you could speculate for us in terms of your impressions. Where was Lee Harvey Oswald going at the time of the shooting of Officer Tibbet? I have no immediate recollection of where he was going at that time. I uh, would have to refresh my memory before I could give you any uh, uh, firm answer. Did you have an opportunity as part of the commission to retrace Lee Harvey Oswald's steps from his rooming house to the shooting of Mr. Tibbet and then to the... Uh, uh, yes, to I went to Dallas uh, with uh, the Chief Justice. And we spent uh, a full day not only interrogating uh, Jack Ruby, but going over precisely uh, Oswald's movements as we understood them uh, during that whole period. And uh, we went Again, I can't recall the number, uh, by the house where the woman was on the porch, et cetera, et cetera. 
in that in that journey did you also travel to Jack Ruby's apartment I don't recall that let me just ask one final question then Mr. President, what would you do to improve the protection of the President of the United States? Well, having uh, experienced uh, 30 months of their protection and their continuing uh, protection at the present time, I think they do a very professional job. They're a fine group of people. They're well organized. I only know firsthand that in two instances, they did a very, very superb job in responding to an assassination attempt. Uh, in the case of uh, Fromm in Sacramento, an agent, Larry Boondorf, really moved in effectively and quickly. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, uh, again, what was done, I thought, was very professional and I am very grateful to how they handle themselves, what they've done and the way they're organized. And I know of no way you can improve it uh, from my personal experience. Thank you, Mr. President. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Dodd, seeking additional recognition. Just, just one question, if I may, and this will be the last one, Mr. President. I know you're running, running behind. Today you've stated that there were a number of alleged incidents or facts uh, uh, that were relevant uh, to one degree or another to the assassination, which you and the other members of the commission, uh, or many of them, were not aware of at the time that you served on the commission. I refer specifically to the existence of the Hostie uh, letter and its contents, or its alleged contents, the allegations that Lee Harvey Oswald might have been an FBI informer, for instance, uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover's so-called second Oswald theory in 1959 when he was living overseas, uh, the assassination plots against uh, Fidel Castro and uh, just recently here in, in questioning from uh, Congressman Edgar, the, uh, uh, the disciplinary action that was taken against the agents uh, in the FBI, things that you were not privy to at the time you were serving on the commission. And I raise those points to ask you this question without, and I understood your answer with regard to the conclusions in, in light of, of these uh, additional releva uh, revelations. But putting that, that aspect of it aside, the conclusions, in terms of an investigation, uh, would it be, would you agree uh, that the investigation of the Warren Commission, and I mean by that, for example, the witnesses <coughs> interrogated, in light of these four or five uh, facts or allegations that I've just mentioned, in light of that, do you feel that the interrogation of the Warren Commission would have called upon additional witnesses, that the, that the investigatory process would have changed as a result of those additional facts and information? To a degree, but I do not believe that there would have been any significant change in the process or the methods. Uh, obviously, we wanted to have all information, including the information that you've related. Unfortunately, for various reasons, it was not made available to the Commission. But I refer again to what I said earlier. I do not think our lack of information in those instances had any adverse impact on our conclusions or would have changed the conclusions. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time Thank you. The gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Devine, seeking additional recognition. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, again, for your total cooperation and your appearance here, I, Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that JFK exhibits 441 and 442 be admitted in evidence and be part of the record. Without objection, they may be entered into the record at this point. Mr. President, at the conclusion of a witness's testimony before this committee, he is entitled under our rules to five minutes. He may take that five minutes for the purpose of commenting upon his testimony or explaining it or expanding upon it in any way. And I would extend to you at this time five minutes for that purpose. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will not take that time. I do wish to express my appreciation to you, the committee members, and the staff for their consideration. It's been a pleasure to be here. I will uh, 
give my time to my two former associates on the commission, uh, uh, John Sherman Cooper and uh, John McCloy, who I'm sure will be very helpful in expanding or uh, improving on uh, my observations here this morning. I thank you very, very much. But thank you, uh, Mr. President, for not only the time you've uh, expended with our staff and Mr. Cornwell prior to your appearance here today, but taking time out of what we know is a very busy schedule to, to appear here and to offer the testimony we've received this morning. As one of your former colleagues here in the House, uh, it's been an honor to have had you here. Thank you. Give my best Thank to everybody. You. Thank you. It certainly will. All persons are requested to remain in their seats uh, for security reasons until President Ford has left the room.